Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Pet Med Express's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Pet Med Express, also known as 1-800-PET-MEDS, is an online pet pharmacy. The company sells prescription and non-prescription pet medication. The company can only fill up prescriptions written by veterinarians. In 1999, the company settled charges with the Florida Pharmacy Board for selling drugs that did not have prescriptions. False advertising, poor record keeping, and not labeling drugs correctly. In addition to pet medications, the company also sold pet accessories, such as leashes. It stopped selling 5,000 products and began focusing strictly on medicine-related items. In 2002, they were fined by the EPA for selling prescription drugs illegally. The drugs were made by Novartis for sale in Europe and Australia, and the doses and labeling were not FDA approved. Also in 2002, the company reached a settlement with the Florida Pharmacy Board for contracting with vets to write prescriptions for animals they have never examined. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 705 million market cap. They're trading at $35 a share and they have 20 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. The company does have positive and consistent free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. They also have positive and consistent net income each year. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that seems to be growing a little bit each year, which is a good sign. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. For example, payroll of the people in their warehouse. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit, and they have pretty consistent gross profit each year, 80 million to 97 million. Below that is operating expenses. Example is depreciation. Then below that is their operating income, and that seems to be decreasing. It was 52 million in 2018. It's down to 38 million. Below that is the interest they receive on their investments. Also, if a company pays debt, this is where the interest payments go, but they don't have any debt. Then below that is other income and expenses. Then their pre-tax income. So the bottom line of their income statement is their net income, and that's pretty consistent each year. When you invest in a company, the best thing is consistency, whether it's consistently good or consistently bad. You want to be able to predict the future. If the numbers are really volatile, it's hard to predict the future. But if the numbers are consistent, it's much easier. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. They don't have much in CapEx. So operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. The company has positive free cash flow each year. Most of this company's free cash flow is used to pay dividends, but they could also use it to buy back stock or invest back into their business. They did buy back $11.5 million of stock in 2020. Operating cash flow is such an important part of your business. If you cannot generate positive operating cash flow, you don't have much of a business. And this company does generate positive operating cash flow each year. And the way you could think about operating cash flow, it's net income converted to cash because net income is accounting profit and loss. There are some non-cash items on the income statement. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, that was 31 million. Then you have to add back the depreciation, that's 2.3 million. Depreciation is a non-cash expense on the income statement. So you have to add it back on the CFO section. There was $173,000 asset impairment. That's another non-cash expense that brings down your net income. Then they had $3 million of stock-based compensation. Even though they reported a $31 million profit, they actually generated $39 million of cash flow. Let's look at a capital structure. 
They have $130 million of equity and no debt. So they're 100% equity. And their WAC is 7.6%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that's $1 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $885 million. We divide that by 20 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $44. They're trading at $35. So they're trading at a 20% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is lower than me. They're at $36 a share. So they're also saying it's undervalued, just not nearly as much as I am. It looks like the stock peaked at about $50 a couple years ago. It's come down a bit, but it came back up. So this stock doesn't seem to be affected by coronavirus. Most stocks have crashed in March. This stock looks fairly steady since coronavirus. It went up a little bit. This company raises their dividend each year from 19 cents up to 28 cents. They pay a 3.2% dividend yield. To calculate dividend yield, just sum up the last four dividend payments then divide that number by the stock price. They pay out 74% of their net income and 62% of their free cash flow. This company has a low beta, 0.69, so the stock moves less than the market. The stock has outperformed the S&P 500, up 21% in the past 52 weeks. The 52-week low was 21, the high was 57. The stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1 to 2 million shares are traded each day for this stock. And of the 20 million shares outstanding, 18 million are on float. Almost all the shares are held by institutions. And it has a really high short percentage. You could see a short squeeze one day for the stock because 39% of the shares on float are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have been at over $40,000 at one point. But if you're still holding on, you'd be at $35,000. That's a pretty good return on investment. That's a 13% annual return. BlackRock is the biggest shareholder at 15%, then Vanguard, Renaissance, State Street, and Dimensional Fund. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 10, the median is 15, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 22.9, so investors are paying $23 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 2.3, so they're better than the median and average. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 5.4. They're a little better than the average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $130 million of equity. 129 million of tangible equity because they have about 1 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. ROE is net income over equity. They have a great ROE at 24%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They have way more than enough current assets to cover their current liabilities. They have over 100 million of cash on their balance sheet. And the company seems to be well capitalized. They had 37 million of free cash flow over 100 million of working capital and a $23 million dividend. So according to my calculation, they have $119 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, the only company in the same industry as PetMed is Walgreens, which I know is a different company, but I'll compare the ratios anyway. PetMeds is doing a lot better in PE, but Walgreens has an amazing price to sales and price to book. PetMeds has a much higher current ratio, they also have a higher ROE and they have no debt. Of course, Walgreens is a much bigger company. They're a massive company, 37 billion market cap. Both companies pay a nice dividend, but Walgreens is higher at 4.28%. So to summarize, this company has been around for 25 years. They provide a much needed service, whether you use a company like them or your local vet. This industry is here to stay because dogs are such an important part of our lives. This company also seems to be growing and they also have a decent market share in their industry. One of the big risks is that the larger chains like Petco can totally demolish this company. But Petco and those larger chains do have a different business model. I guess you can say Petco is like the Walmart of PetMed Express. I rank their free cash flows 3 out of 10 
They are consistent, but they're pretty small. I rank their revenue 4 out of 10. It is growing, which is nice, but it's still pretty small. And I rank their ratios 8 out of 10. They have really good ratios. Plus, they're able to grow their business without any debt, which is nice. But they are a tiny company under 1 billion market cap. They do nicely compensate their investors with a 3.2% dividend. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.